أرحب بجميع السادة الحضور، أرحب بأساتذتي الأفاضل، أرحب بزملائي الأعزاء، أرحب بالأخوة الأشقاء من مختلف الدول العربية. بشكركم على الانضمام إلى جروب إيجيبشن أونلاين سيمينار. الهدف منه نقل العلم والمعرفة من خلال عقد مجموعة من السيمينارات العلمية الأونلاين. بسعدنا وشرفنا اليوم تواجد الأستاذة الدكتورة سلمى إبراهيم. أستاذ المحاسبة المشارك ومدير قسم البحوث بكلية إدارة الأعمال بجامعة كينجستون بإنجلترا، وقد حصلت سيادتها على درجة الماجستير من جامعة سيراكويز، ودرجة الدكتوراه من جامعة ميريلاند بالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية، وقد شغلت العديد من المناصب الأكاديمية في عدد من الجامعات بالولايات المتحدة الأمريكية، مثل جامعة الدونيميكان في شيكاغو، وجامعة ولاية مورجان. ولسيادتها العديد من الأبحاث العلمية المنشورة في كبرى الدوريات العلمية الدولية في مجال المحاسبة. وقد أسست سيادتها مجموعة خاصة بأبحاث أسواق المال بجامعة كينجستون عام 2016 وتعمل مديرا لها منذ ذلك الحين إلى الآن. بنشكرها جزيل الشكر على انضمامها ونسأل الله لها التوفيق والسداد وجزاها الله عنا كل خير وجعله الله في ميزان حسنة. إن شاء الله الجزء الأول من المحاضرة ستقوم الدكتورة مشكورة بالعرض والشر الجزء الثاني من المحاضرة سيخصص للأسئلة وإن شاء الله تكون محاضرة موفقة بإذن الله تفضل دكتورة سلم الله يخليك متشكرة جدا أنا هامل الشيرنج الأول متشكرة جدا على الدعوة أنا مبسوطة جدا سعيدة جدا أن أنا هنا موجودة مع حضراتكم النهاردة آه وانا سعيده برضو ان ان في بلاتفورم زي كده موجود في مصر انا دايما احب اشوف تواصل ما بين الباحثين آه جوه مصر وخارج مصر آه والاكاديميين ويا ريت المحاضره تلاقوها النهارده مفيده وانا دايما احب يعني اتواصل مع الطلبه اللي في مصر واساعدهم باي شكل ممكن أه واتمنى النجاح لكل الطلبه الموجودين النهارده في طلبه الدكتوراه او الماجستير او اللي بيفكروا أه يقدموا على دكتوراه هل السكرين ظاهره ولا لا الشاشه ظاهره اوكي متهيالي ان تمام تمام دكتور اوكي أه طيب زي ما محمد قال أه دكتور محمد قال أه المحاضرة هتبقى تقريبا 40 دقيقة 45 دقيقة هتكلم عن earnings management وبعدين هيبقى في أسئلة آه للأسف بقى المحاضرة هتبقى باللغة الإنجليزية لأن كل الترمينولوجي هيبقى صعب علي إن أنا أقوله بالعربي آه فـ hopefully يعني الموضوع ده يبقى كويس أوكي فالمحاضرة النهاردة عن earnings management فهي targeting الناس اللي هم بيعملوا أبحاث في المحاسبة in accounting أه ولكن هحاول ابسط الافكار شويه على اساس برضو الناس انا عارفه ان في شويه ناس في بيزنس او تسويق او فروع اخرى فعشان كل الناس تفهم معنى بالعربيه اداره الارباح ايرنجز مانجمنت بس هيبقى في بعض الاجزاء فيري سبيسيفيك ولازم يبقى في شويه اكاونتنج باك جراوند عشان تتفهم هبتدي الاول شويه باك جراوند عن نفسي آه زي ما محمد بريزنتد آه مي هو انا بصراحه انا اتخرجت من جامعه حلوان تجاره خارجيه جامعه حلوان 1993 آه بدرجه المحاسبه وبعدين خدت الماجستير في اكاونتنج برضو آه من امريكا سيركيوز يونيفرستي في 1999 وبعدين دكتوراه في 2005 وكله ان اكاونتنج فانا التريل بتاعي كله اكاونتنج ومن ساعه 2005 الريسيرش بتاعي في الارنينجز مانجمنت Uh, the interest research interest بتاعتي earnings management, uh, earnings management related to other characteristics such as executive compensation, bankruptcy, um, and such. Uh, Muhammad El, I have founded and directed the Capital Market Research Group since 2016. Okay, so if we get started, uh, the agenda looks like this. I'll talk a little bit about the background of earnings management. What does earnings management mean? I'll be, provide some definitions of earnings management, uh, the different themes of research in the earnings management literature, and then I will talk specifically about one of my recent working papers in the earnings management field, and my opinion, what I think the direction of the future within this field looks like, which might provide some ideas for some of you who are planning on doing some research activities within the accounting field. 
Okay, so I'm sure a lot of you, whether accounting or not, will be familiar with the concept of earnings management, starting with Enron back in 2000. This was the first biggest case of earnings management where the, comp the company failed within a couple of days, uh, and it turned out that a lot of their financial statements were fake. Uh, since then, we've heard about Satyam in India in 2009, in the UK, we have Tesco in 2014, which all, also had cases of uh, manipulation. Uh, there's Patty Sri Valerie, which is a very nice bakery in the UK. That's back in 2018-19, where they also were, were instances of earnings management. And even outside Europe, uh, there's cases in China. Recently, just in uh, early 2020, uh, a coffee brand, which is a competitor of Starbucks called Looking Coffee, in China was also investigated for potential $300 million uh, fraud. So all of these are examples of cases where earnings management came into play. So basically the background of this is uh, the importance of accounting information. So if you are in accounting or if you're familiar with accounting, you will know that there has been evidence, research evidence historically, that accounting information is both useful and this started with the research of Bolin Brown in 1968, showing that uh, profits in the financial statements of companies were important in directing the price of the shares in the capital market. And they are also value relevant, which started with the research of Olson in 1995, showing that the stock price, the share price at any point in time, can be determined by accounting information. So accounting, and here we're talking about profits, arbah, profits. Profits are important to investors, to other stakeholders, and to the capital market. And this can be seen in the definition of what accounting is or what financial information is as prescribed by the um, international financial reporting standards. They state that financial information is useless, useful when it is both relevant and represents faithfully what it purports to represent. So the importance of accounting will only be there if uh, accounting information is true and fair. Uh, the problem obviously with earnings management is that, is that it deviates, it makes the statements deviate from this true and fair concept. And if we focus on the Enron case, only because it is the most uh, well-known case of earnings management, this was back in 2001, and up to the time that it declared bankruptcy in December 2001, uh, there was no evidence that there were any problems in operations of the business. At the time of their failure, they had 20,000 employees. They had assets worth $63 billion. Uh, and all of this vanished within a day, once they declared bankruptcy. And they, it turned out that they had substantial management uh, using different techniques. won't go into that. And if you are interested to know a bit more specifically into how accounting manipulation or earnings manipulation can be done, a very uh, interesting film or book is the one about Enron, which is the smartest guys in the room. So I recommend that you try to watch that film or read the book, which will tell you about the details of the earnings manipulation that happened within Enron. And if you look at the financial statements of Enron right before bankruptcy, uh, they were very showing very healthy profits. So they had profits in year 2000, which is the year right before its bankruptcy, of uh, $1 billion. So there was no evidence in the financial statements that they were having any financial problems, even though in reality they were. So this was kind of the biggest case of uh, earnings management uh, in history. All right, so if we talk about the different views of earnings management. It kind of breaks down into two groups. One is the opportunistic perspective, where managers are seen as uh, using earnings management as an opportunistic uh, tactic to trick outsiders and to gain some private gains for themselves. And this comes through from the positive accounting theory, which is based on the Watson Zimmerman uh, ideas or book in 1978. And then the other perspective is the informational per perspective, where earnings management can actually be a good thing, a positive thing, trying to provide uh, a signal or 
positive information to the market about the future. And this comes through the signaling perspective where accounting may have its own problems from being reliant too much on conservatism, uh, and therefore managers who are good people are trying to provide more information to the market through uh, signaling the future performance within the financial statements. Most of the views on earnings management uh, are the opportunistic one, which is the view that managers are manipulating profits or uh, manipulating uh, the financial statements for their own gains. And one of the most important definitions in that regard is the Healy and Wallen definition in 1999, where they discuss that managers uh, use judgment in financial reporting and in structuring transactions to alter financial reports. Therefore, under this idea, the opportunistic view, uh, earnings management is seen as a negative thing, where uh, managers or companies are using their judgment within reporting to provide information that is false for their own purposes, to make more money, to make higher bonuses, or for whatever. We'll talk about those purposes in a minute. So this is an important definition. There are several definitions of earnings management, and I've listed a few here, and you'll see on the right uh, some papers that have used these particular definitions in the literature. Um, so you have the Healy and Wallen definition, which shows earnings management as occurring when managers use judgment, which has been used in the Chow Sloan and Sweeney, Chu Taylor and Dugan 2007, Roy Chowdhury in 2006. So all of this is based on the opportunistic view. You have a similar definition by Shipper in 1989, which is uh, earnings management is a purposeful intervention in the external financial reporting process with the intent of obtaining, obta obtaining some private gain. gain. So uh, pretty much it's the same idea again, which states that uh, managers use this manipulation to make their own private gain. So if I'm a manager of, uh, let's say, Tesco, I will decide I am going to uh, play about in those numbers. I want to show profits of a certain amount because it will help me. So it's not to help anybody other than managers themselves. And this again was used, this definition was used in some research. And then you have another similar one showing that earnings management is the choice of a manager of accounting policies, including voluntary earnings forecasting, disclosure and estimation of accruals to affect earnings intentionally. Okay, so all of these definitions are pretty similar. They show that earnings management is something that is done by managers for their own private gain, for their own purposes, uh, which is opportunistic on their behalf. And they're the ones who are going to be gaining. Uh, outsiders, employees, investors uh, will not gain from this. You have also an alternative term, which is similar, sometimes used interchangeably, creative accounting. So this is another form of earnings management or another term that can be used for earnings management. And we have a couple of definitions here. Uh, so Melahi, Morel and Wood, 2010, define it as the use of permitted cosmetic window dressing accounting techniques to present a flattering picture of a company's financial state. Um, and another definition here, it is not against the law, it operates within the letter both of the law and of the accounting standards. So basically all of these definitions are very similar. They present the opportunistic view of earnings management where managers themselves are trying to gain for their own purposes by manipulating bottom line uh, profit of the companies. And then you have an alternative view, which is the income smoothing, which is if profits are going up and down throughout the years, um, a, a, a way to kind of smooth out the variability in income is through this income smoothing. And this relates to the signal, signaling perspective, uh, which one of the definitions by Copeland 1968 shows that it involves the repetitive selection of accounting measurement or reporting rules in a particular pattern, the effect of which is to report the stream of income with a smaller variation from trend than would otherwise have appeared. So if we expect profits to be high in one year, low in another, high in a third, low and so forth, 
in order to make it more smooth, a smooth pattern where each year profit looks pretty much the same, you can use some income smoothing techniques, which is similar to earnings management, but maybe not an opportunistic view. Another definition here, Beadleman 1973, shows that it is the intentional dampening of fluctuations about some level that is currently considered to be normal of a firm. So if you think that normal profit of a firm should be uh, a million pounds per year, let's say, then you will always aim to show within your financial statements that one, one million pounds per year by using some income smoothing techniques. Okay, so those are the definitions of earnings management, uh, both the opportunistic and the signaling view. The theories, I won't go through them, but if you want to read through the theories that uh, drive earnings management or that relate to earnings management, the most commonly used one is the agency theory, which shows the disconnect between uh, the principal and the agent, the principal here being uh, the shareholders, the owners of the company, and the agent being the managers who are running the company. And earnings management is, is inevitable because both of those have different interests. Uh, related to that is managerial power, which states that uh, the, the CEO or the top manager within any firm uh, has the high wielding power and therefore uh, will control what the company will look like, what the board of directors will look like, and, and what the reporting uh, within the financial statements will look like. Similarly, you have stakeholder theory, which start looking outside instead of just focusing on shareholders. You have other stakeholders like creditors, employees, uh, and the public. You have gender socialization theory, which tries to look at the role of females and males within the governance structure. Social emotional wealth theory, which uh, talks about uh, the company being a unit like a team and the, and each member of the team tries to fit in with the rest of the team. And that may also drive earnings management uh, between the CEO, CFO and so forth. And then you have the upper echelon theory, which focuses on the different characteristics uh, of uh, people at the top, CEO, CFO and so forth. So these are interesting theories to read. I mean, I've given you some references here. Um, so read a bit further about each one if you are interested in this. All right, so what are the different research themes within earnings management? So um, I got most of these from the 2008 uh, literature review by Verbruggen, Christians and Millis. And what they did is they looked at 153 articles uh, from the top 10 accounting journals um, uh, over the period 2000-2006. They read through all of these and they tried to determine the different themes uh, that were being published related to earnings management. And they came up with four themes, which are basically the most of the themes that uh, you can categorize earnings management literature into. Uh, you have the first one is the motives of earnings management. You have the techniques of earnings management, restrictions, and research design. So I'm going to talk about each of these separately. So the motives talk about the incentives or the motivations, the reasons why managers uh, engage in opportunistic or signal, signaling earnings management. The techniques talk about the how. How do managers actually manipulate profits? The research design talks about the methodological issues. How can us as researchers or shareholders detect whether a company has manipulated profits or not? And then the final one is about monitoring or restrictions. What things within the company or outside the company can restrict or reduce the prevalence of earnings management? All right, so if we start talking about the motives first, so we'll look at the literature examples of things within the literature that provide incentives or motivations uh, that managers face to engage in earnings management. So those can fall in neatly into five different groups. So there are incentives or reasons related to the stock market. Uh, the reasons that uh, are signaling reasons or concealing to hide private information. You have the political costs and you have internal motives and finally CEO personal incentives. So I'll give you examples of some papers within each of these theme, themes and try to explain some of these. 
So the first one is the stock market incentives, the capital market incentives. And the most clear one is uh, a company's desire to meet analyst expectations. So all companies, especially uh, in the U.S., and in the UK, maybe not so much in the developing world, but companies in the US and the UK care a lot about their analyst expectations. They have analysts that follow the companies and uh, each year they expect future profits, what it would look like. So an analyst can say, we expect Tesco uh, at the end of 2021 to present profit of two pounds per share. Okay, so this is a, a motivation for engages in, in earnings management. And basically companies don't want to break those expectations. They want to meet or beat those expectations. And examples of papers in that theme are Bart of et al. 2002, Payne and Rob 2000, Jiang et al. 2018, and Rene Camp et al. 2020. So there's lots of papers in this theme which look at analysts' expectations and try to see whether companies are driven by these expectations to manipulate profits. You have uh, the theme of insider trading. So uh, managers or employees within companies that want to make profits from uh, trading on information within the firm and will use earnings management to do that. There's papers like Benish and Vargas, uh, Baker et al. 2003, Bartov and Mohanram 2003, Osma et al. 2020. So all of these are around the theme of insider trading. And then you have uh, the theme of shares, new shares to the market. So around initial public offerings. So a company, when it initially goes onto the market and starts selling shares to the market, right before it does it, there is evidence that they manipulate profit upwards so that they can share, sell their shares at a higher price. And the same around secondary equity offerings. If they decide to sell further shares to the market, there is evidence that they uh, manipulate profits upwards, so they show a higher level of profit uh, to the market and are able to sell at a higher price. So all of these are different reasons why companies are driven to manipulate, manipulate bottom line profit based on stock market incentives. And then you have the big one, which is me meeting other earnings benchmarks. So similar to the analyst expectations, most companies want to meet a specific earnings benchmark, uh, which could include last year's profit or just zero. Companies don't want to show that they're making losses. They want to show that they are making profits. And this is based on the prospect theory, Kahneman and Versky in 1979. And this theory specific specifically says that anybody, any individual, including investor, will always be focused on a specific reference point in this case, a particular level of earnings. And they would expect that any deviation from this level of earnings will cause them to react negative, will cause investors to react negatively. Uh, and here's a good example of this. Uh, just end of last year, September 2019, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Pearson Company, which is a big publisher, and they have lots of publications of um, academic books, their stock price crashed 18% uh, because they cut their profit guidance, uh, which means they weren't going to meet their profit uh, expectations, and therefore the stock price immediately crashed by 18%. So basically there's lots of push from the stock market to maintain the level of profit as prior year or to maintain the profit in line with what analysts expect. And most of the research in this area relies on uh, this distribution uh, methodology, which looks at the distributions of earnings per share. Um, and the first author to deal with this was Burke Stoller in Dichev in 1997. And uh, if you take a look at this distribution, so these are all the companies in the U.S. over the period 1976 to 1994, and it's the profit that they are presenting um, and under a normal distribution, it would look simply like a bell shape where you'd have most of the profits here around the mean median. And then you have trailing off a few companies that make huge profits, few companies that make very small profits. But if you notice, there is a break at this point here, and this is the zero profit break. So basically companies, if they feel that they are going to make 
losses. They are not going to be showing profits during the year. They will push their profit upwards so that they end up in this group here. OK, so there is evidence that they are pushing their profits from below zero to above zero. And this is evidence of that particular reference point, which is zero profit being important in uh, incentivizing or motivation, motivating managers to manipulate profits. I did find interestingly an Egyptian uh, research in this area, which is back from 2012. Ibrahim Said Abed, who had this particular paper earnings management to meet or beat earnings thresholds uh, in an Egyptian sample. And he found similar results where there was a break at zero, which a little bit hard to see here, but the numbers here are very tiny and then they grow massively around profit. So again, this is a stock market incentive showing that if a company believes it will make losses or will not make profits the same as last year's, they will push their profits upwards and manipulate profits upwards so that they're showing gains. So that's the theme of stock markets. That's the first theme of uh, incentives, which is stock market incentives. The second area or theme of research is uh, the signaling view and uh, either providing or concealing private information. And under this view, there is some research about earnings management around bankruptcy. So before a company goes bankrupt or if it is in financial distress, it may uh, go through some earnings management techniques in order to conceal or hide that they are failing. And one of the examples of that obviously would be Enron, where they didn't want to show they were failing and therefore they manipulated profits to show that they were uh, successful. Uh, or uh, the signaling view uh, would be where a company is trying to show that their future performance may be better and they're signaling private information about the future. Examples of papers in this could be Lewis, Lewis and Robinson 2005, Tucker and Zero in 2006, Ding Kang and Schultz 2016, and El Shatrat Hosseini and El Shatrat 2020. So all of these papers indicate that companies use earnings management in order to provide, to signal private information that they have about future performance. The next group of incentives are what we call political costs, and these could include government regulation. So if a company is trying to escape or avoid any government regulation, it again may resort to earnings management. And one example of that is Hotel in 2005, uh, in China, they have a requirement that you have to have at least 10% return on equity before you can issue any stock. And therefore, there was evidence that companies are manipulating their profit upwards to make sure that they, cut, they, they reach this 10% ROE in order to be able to issue stock. So if, if the government is setting any rules, any regulations that profit has to be at a certain level, you can rest assured that um, companies will manipulate profit in order to meet those restrictions. Also tax avoidance. So the famous Jones 1991 paper, this was all about tax avoidance uh, around import, imports of goods. Uh, so again, companies, if they feel that they will be paying too much tax and they don't want to pay taxes, they will show lower profits. They will reduce their profits by using earnings management techniques in order to avoid that tax. And you also have uh, around labor renegotiation costs. So if a company is negotiating again, and this is especially important in a country like uh, the UK, uh, maybe a little bit Egypt, when there are big strong unions that negotiate the prices of salaries and how much uh, you have to pay your employees, when companies go into the negotiations, they uh, try to show that their profits are very low so that they actually come up with good deals and don't have to pay huge salaries to their employees. So anytime when money is involved and when you're trying to show that your profits are not that high, earnings management will be the, the way to go under political costs. And then we also have internal motives, so motives within the company that lead managers to possibly manipulate profits, and these include budget ratcheting. Uh, so that's at the division level. So instead of at top level, top management, 
at division level, if each division is given certain budgets that they have to follow, and if they meet their budget or exceed their budget for a year, uh, this typically will mean that their budget next year will be higher. So in order to avoid that, some research shows that they will manipulate their profits downwards in order to avoid the budgets from going higher and higher in future years. And then you also have some research about the performance benchmarks. So if I am a division manager and I am trying to meet some benchmarks that are provided to me by my superiors, again, I may use some earnings management techniques. And finally, you can have um, the concept of employment security. If employees uh, want to feel that they are uh, secure in their job and that the company is not going to fail, the, the managers can also use some earnings management techniques in order to uh, show that profits are maybe higher than they actually are in order to uh, provide the security to their employees. So these are all motives within the company rather than the company dealing with outsiders. And then finally, importantly, this is probably the most researched area and probably the biggest incentive of earnings management, which is incentives related to this chief executive officer, their own personal incentives. And this all comes from pay or turnover. So the fir first one is about CEO turnover or retirement. So if a CEO feels that they are coming up to retirement, they may have uh, incentives to uh, reduce profits. When a CEO has come in, you, there's a new CEO, CEO turnover, then they have also incentives to reduce profits now so that in the future their profits will be higher. So there's several papers about that. You have papers related to bonus pay. So if uh, bonuses are tied to profits and uh, CEOs want to make high bonuses, then they will have to manipulate their profits in order to receive this high pay. The same for stock-based pay. If profit is linked to stock-based pay, uh, and again, people, individuals are always going to want more money than less money. If you tell them you're going to get paid more, if the profit of the company is more, then you should expect uh, earnings management in that case. So the problem here is that earnings is typically tied to CO payments. So payments within the company are tied to how much profit the company makes. And this can be seen in this particular curve, which is from the Cho and Jang uh, paper in 2010. This is what a typical bonus scheme would look like. Uh, so here on the x-axis, you have the return on assets, so profit during the year. And then on the y-axis, you have the bonus, then the amount of bonus that is paid during the year. And if you see at this point here, when profits are low, there will be no bonus at all. A company will not pay bonuses to their CEOs. And when uh, profits increase, you will see that also bonuses do not increase beyond the level. So where, wherever profit may end up, if, if let's say the company's profit ends up to be here, they may be incentives to increase profit to this level, at which case, in which case the bonus will increase, right? So whenever bonuses or any form of payment to CEOs is linked directly to profit, there will be an incentive to manipulate profit. Um, and we can see this in the Sainsbury. This is a big supermarket chain in the UK. Their 2019 uh, annual report shows that the bonus, the annual bonus, is tied directly. 70% of the bonus is tied to annual operational, sorry, onto group profit. So 70% of the bonus is tied to group profit. And for their deferred share award, which is a long term. Uh, payment award, it is also half of it is based on uh, profit. Okay, so when companies link the pay to their executives to profit, this will inevitably lead to earnings management of the profit. All right, so those are the motives or the incentives. You have the stock market incentives, you have the pay or the CEO uh, personal incentives, you have the political costs. Uh, and then you have um, some other reasons uh, to incentivize managers to manipulate profits. 
Moving on to the second theme, which is the techniques. How do firms manage earnings? How do firms or managers actually uh, increase or decrease the profits? And under this theme, there are some research about manipulation through using specific accruals. Uh, so this, I think only people involved in accounting would understand accruals. Um, so you have possibly the tax expense, deferral that can be used. That's in Daliwal et al. You have restructuring charges, which may be used, uh, allowance for loan losses. So those papers look at investigate one accrual account uh, by itself. You have other research that looks at total accruals. So all of the accruals together. And this is by far the most common way of investigating uh, earnings management. And it is what is called accrual uh, manipulation. Uh, like the Jones 1991 paper, the Chow et al, uh, up to the Chow et al 2010. And the basic premise of this is that uh, us as researchers can estimate what the abnormal or the discretionary level of accruals are based on this model here what is called the modified Jones model, the most common one. So accruals is seen as a uh, 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 dependent on the change in revenue, less change in receivable and property plant and equipment. OK, so based on this, without going into too much details, this tries to look at the overall total accruals, the abnormal level of accruals within a year, and that is an estimate of uh, earnings manipulation. Uh, some of the limitations within this theme, if I can uh, talk about this for a minute, is that you either the, the papers either look at one specific accrual account or total accruals together without looking at the interaction be between these accruals. Um, so my paper, and this is based on my PhD, my paper in 2009 actually investigated, what I tried to do was investigate earnings management using the traditional abnormal or discretionary accrual measure, comparing it to an alternative measure using separate components of accruals. And what I did uh, was look at the different components like receivables, inventory, payable, other working capital depreciation separately and try to determine the abnormal level of each of these independently and then mix them together, add them together to come up with an alternative measure of discretionary accruals. And what I found was that these measures, this alternative measure was actually better, better able to detect manipulation uh, in a random sample that had included artificial manipulation and a litigation sample. So the numbers are not hugely different. So instead of finding 78% of what was there, it found 80% and instead of 4% here, 7%. So there was definitely an improvement. So I think this is an area that potentially can uh, move further in research. So instead of relying on the total accruals measure, try to look at specific accounts and investigate how all of these specific inf accounts in interact together. So how managers might use uh, receivables and inventory and payables and so forth together. So that's the one, the accrual one. The next type of manipulation is done through real accounts. So this could be from uh, trying to increase sales by giving more discounts, from increasing production, which would reduce the cost uh, of goods sold for each unit, um, or from uh, eliminating some of your discretionary expenses like research and development or advertising, something like that. So these themes can be found in these papers, Rebar 2006, Roy Chowdhury 2006, and Cohen Zaro in 2010. And finally, you have uh, the classification shifting, which is manipulating by shifting from one account to another. So the, the, the McVeigh one 2006 looks at companies that try to hide some of their losses within the non-recurring items. So instead of having it in the main body of the income statement, it, they would hide it in the non-recurring items of the income statement. OK, so all of these are different papers that investigate the different methods of manipulation, how manipulation is done. And if you want to read a bit further, uh, 
in, in this theme, you can look at some of my papers. So I have the paper recently, 2019, which is looking at uh, both accrual and real manipulation in companies in the UK uh, around uh, incentives related to CEO bonus contracts. Uh, the next one here was uh, uh, in co co collaboration with the PhD students at Kingston University investigating both accrual and real base manipulation uh, of companies before acquisitions. When a company is acquiring another company, buying another company, uh, they also uh, provide, there is evidence of manipulation. And the final one, again, is investigating real and accrual base manipulation uh, for companies that are offering secondary equity offerings. So before they uh, decide to uh, offer shares to the market in a secondary offering, uh, there's evidence that they engage in real and accrual manipulation. Okay, so this second theme that I talked about, whoops, sorry, is about how the manipulation is done through real and accrual based manipulation. Moving on to the third theme, which is uh, the research design. So these types of papers are usually very, very technical, and they look about look at the models that uh, aim to detect earnings management. Um, so some of these look at the accrual manipulation models and try to show how they can be improved. Uh, one of these, uh, a, a recent one, Bayer, Gutman and Marinovich, tries to include investor uncertainty into the current models, if you're interested to look at that. And then you have other papers like the benchmark meeting that I talked about before, uh, and they try to improve those models. And, and a, a recent one here, um, and I don't want to talk too much about this. Uh, remember, we talked about the normal distribution before and the companies that have small losses that will push towards the so, small profit. So this is what the distribution would look like before manipulation. After manipulation, you'll have companies here uh, making small losses are less than what they should be, and companies that are showing small profits are higher. And this paper actually tries to look at the probability of being uh, a group here that is making small losses and small profits. So this is a very interesting paper if you want to look at it, just recently uh, published in Journal of Accounting Economics. It is a bit complicated to read, but this is kind of one of the directions forward to investigate the uh, methodologies of earnings management. And then finally, you have the monitoring or restrictions. And this is probably the area where you have most of the recent research and I think probably has the best uh, chance of, of research moving forward. So it's what are the different characteristics or factors that can restrict or reduce earnings management. So within this theme, So you have uh, papers that look at the effect of accounting standards. So, for example, when IFRS was implemented in the UK, was it better or worse? Did it limit earnings management? You have principle-based versus rule-based economies. Uh, and was, this, was there any effect on limiting earnings management? So here's some of the papers in this area. Uh, you have the effect of governance, things like the board. Uh, compensation committee, audit committee, independence of the board, the power, uh, power, powerful CEOs. These are examples of papers within this theme. What can restrict or limit earnings management? And then you have the effect of auditors, whether stronger auditors, big four auditors are better at restricting or limiting earnings management. And an interesting one, this 2019 paper uh, in uh, Contemporary Accounting Research looks at an experimental setting on 113 auditors and they find that they ask them survey questions and they find that auditors uh, that think a company may have engaged in real uh, manipulation is less likely to retain the client. So they will drop the client and move to another client, uh, indicating that they see them as high risk. All right, um, I talked a lot and I think I'm already kind of 45 minutes into the talk. So I just want to briefly talk about one of my recent working papers, which is still in the theme of earnings management, but it is uh, 
probably related to this late, late last thing that we talked about, uh, uh, the restrictions or the monitoring in conjunction with the alternative techniques. So this looks at uh, the risk reporting within companies in conjunction with earning smoothing, whether earning smoothing in this case provides uh, a signaling or whether it is managerial opportunism. So this is in conjunction with a PhD student of mine, Hind Monjit, who is now at Qatar University, um, and the working paper is from March 2020. Okay, so in this paper, what we try to uh, do is look at the look at the association, the link between two different strategies that companies may engage in. One being the income smoothing, which I talked about before, is reducing the variability in profit and other being providing risk disclosure, more or less risk disclosure. And there are two views which are linked to the earnings management views. Under the opportunistic view, if companies have opportunistic incentives and they are trying to present things that make them look better, then they will tend to hide risk information. So if a company is facing high risks, they will provide less risk disclosures. At the same time, they will also engage in income smoothing to, to hide variability in income. Therefore, we would expect it that to be a negative relationship, a negative association between risk disclosures and income smoothing under the opportunistic view. On the other hand, if companies have uh, signaling incentives and they're trying to signal or provide their private information, we would expect them to provide more risk disclosures, more information through their risk disclosure, and at the same time, uh, reduce the variability in their profit through signaling incentives. Therefore, we expect a positive association or link between the level of risk disclosures and earning smoothing. So what we do here is we investigate uh, a set of companies within the FTSE, uh, that's the FTSE 100 in the UK companies, over the period 2005 and 15. And we have 74 companies and 814 firm year observations. We run a content analysis of the risk uh, terminology within the annual report in order to calculate a risk disclosure measure. So the risk disclosure measure is the natural logarithm of the total number of sentences that contain at least one risk-related word. These include things like challenging, fluctuating, uh, risk, susceptible, or threat. And then income smoothing is simply the variability between profit and cash flow. So it's the ratio of uh, operating income divided by uh, standard deviation of cash flow from operations. And what we find is that companies that provide more risk information tend to smooth less, or companies that provide more income smoothing uh, are providing less risk disclosures. And this uh, supports the opportunistic view of earnings management. Therefore, um, we uh, conclude that there is uh, opportunism involved here, that companies are providing less risk disclosures and doing more income smoothing. And you can see here in the main results where the link between risk disclosure and smoothing is negative and significant. We also investigate the effect of the financial crisis. Um, and what we find is that the negative association between risk disclosure and income smoothing is higher, more pronounced during the global financial crisis than before, which indicates that when there was more risk involved in the financial crisis, companies were hiding more of their risk disclosures. And you see this here as a more prominent negative uh, association. Uh, and we run several robustness tests. So we, overall, we conclude that there is evidence of an opportunistic view of earnings management and alternative form of disclosure because they are neg negatively related. And this extends the literature on the opportunistic versus the signaling view of earnings management. Okay, so uh, that kind of concludes my discussion about the literature in earnings management. So just to recap, there's a lot of research out there about earnings management. Uh, a lot of it is focused on accrual manipulation, uh, but recently, following 2002, 2003, there has been a lot more research on real manipulation. 
Uh, and recently, in the past five years, let's say, there's been a more of a drive to focus on governance and monitoring factors that may limit or restrain earnings management. But there are still some gaps in the literature. I have a few slides here and then I'll be done. Uh, what I try to show are what I believe are the gaps in the literature that may give some ideas of, of where to move next if you are interested in uh, investigating anything in earnings management. So the first one that I think is moving away from uh, the CEO personal incentives. So instead of focusing on the CEO, focus on individuals within companies other than the CEO. And an example of this is the Ober, I'm not sure you see this, Oberholzer, Gee and Wolf working paper. Uh, and what they do is they, they focus on division managers, managers within the divisions of the companies rather than uh, the CEO. So I think uh, one good way to go in this literature, area of literature is to move away from CEO incentives into other incentives, people within the company other than the CEO, how they may come into play. Another idea is to focus on other types of companies. So most of the research is in profit companies, for-profit companies. Uh, less research sectors like charities or multinationals with subsidiaries might be a way to go. So for example, this interesting paper in 2019, Brazil and Kital, uh, investigated how companies that have several subsidiaries manipulate profits, and they found that multinationals uh, actually manage earnings through an orchestrated reporting strategy across their different subsidiaries. All right, so focusing on not typical for-profit big firms, but maybe other types of sectors, other types of organizations, private firms, uh, charitable firms, something like that. Another idea might be to focus on other types of disclosures, not earnings. Like the example that I talked about, risk disclosures. Um, there's big researchers always state that it's not just uh, profit that is important. The nature of business operations and strategy are important in studying earnings behavior, what Patricia DeChow mentioned. And also Ball from the Ball and Brown paper uh, it states that it's important to examine how firm fundamentals affect earnings properties. So I think it's important to move away just from looking at profit itself, the financial statement itself, and other disclosures, CSR disclosures, um, risk disclosures, other type of information that is provided by the firm, how it links with earnings management. And then finally, look at the trade-off between the costs and benefits of earnings management. So Barth in 2018 mentioned that researchers have not investigated the trade-off between the cost of earnings management and the benefits. So it is her expectation that it's okay for companies to manage earnings, but how much is okay? We don't know that. So what is the level of earnings management we should expect uh, that is okay, that investors will be happy with, and what goes beyond that? So it's a cost-benefit analysis, and especially if we're trying to compare accrual and real ma manipulation. There's very little uh, research that has been done about trying to find the relationship or the substitution effect between accrual and real manipulation. So those are my ideas about future research. And obviously, importantly now, whether Egypt, in the UK, wherever, uh, we are in a situation where companies have shut down and where profits are going to fall. So it may be worthwhile to investigate the earnings management that may occur uh, following the um, COVID situation that we are in. Um, there's a few papers, not going to talk about them, but just some working papers that you might want to investigate that are, in my opinion, interesting, that investigate things that are not typical in accounting literature, like this one here, doing good when doing well, ev evidence on real earnings management. This was posted in 2020 on SSRN, and it looks at utility companies, electricity companies, uh, how they manipulate around annual weather variation. So if uh, if it's getting very hot, very cold, uh, is the electricity that is used, used by people. And I think this is very important in Egypt, uh, where uh, over the summer, let's say, people use a lot of their electricity on um, air conditioning and so forth. The electricity will spike. Does this provide incentives to manipulate profits? 
on the part of the utility companies. I know they are governmental organizations, but even governmental organizations will have incentives to manipulate their budgets. Uh, you have another paper here, which has been published in 2019 in Journal of Business Finance, Finance and Accounting, which was investigating employees other than the CEOs and their option-based compensation. This was also an interesting paper, um, and I think this is the final one. Uh, the impact of earnings management on bankruptcy. So linking other types of research, like bankruptcy prediction, linking it with earnings management. Uh, this was an interesting paper where they looked at accrual manipulation uh, included in, in a model on, of bankruptcy, and it actually improved uh, the detection of bankrupt firms. Okay, so thank you for listening. Uh, these are all the people that I would like to thank who contributed to uh, the research that I talked about, so part of my capital research working group, and then my PhD student, Sin Monjit, who's now at Qatar, Mohammed Tahir, who's now at Newcastle University, and my current PhD student, Ivana Rajik, who's still at Kingston University. Um, and then a couple of suggested reading. If you want any references from the papers that I mentioned, please feel free to email me. Um, I should have put my email here, but it's s.ibrahim at kingston.ac.uk, um, and then I'd be happy to share uh, the slides or the papers that I have mentioned. Okay, so I'm finished, and I can take questions. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear uh, uh, Salma, yeah. for your effort and uh, contribution, your contribution. Uh, thank you very much. شكرا جزيلا دكتورتنا العزيزة غالية على المحاضرة الأكثر من رائعة. استفدنا منها كثير. محاضرة من أجمل المحاضرات ومحاضرة ذات سمعة مليئة بالأفكار والموضوعات الجميلة وموضوع مهم موضوع حيوي الناس كثير استفادت منه. وبشكر حضرتك تاني دكتورتنا غالية وإن شاء الله الآن يعني بالنسبة لو عند أي حد عنده استفسار ممكن يفتح المايك ويسأل الدكتورة وبس نستأذنه يقفل المايك تاني بعد كده. Everyone, anyone can, anyone have any questions, you can open the, the mic and ask your, hear your questions, then close the, your mic. الأسئلة ممكن ممكن حضرتك السؤال باللغة العربية أو بالإنجليزية؟ آه بالعربي ممكن بالإنجليزي بس لو عرفت أرد بالعربي. <تصفيق> أولاً شكراً جزيلاً للاستماع ويا ريت إن أنا ما أكونش اتكلمت بسرعة وإني ما كنتش بتكلم بليفل عالي على على اللي هما بره أكاونتنج فيلد. Uh, and, uh, ال ال research اللي أنا اتكلمت عنه specifically for accounting and earnings management the الو الو معلش الخط ظهر عندي قطع او حاجه <تصفيق> لا 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 ولا يهمك الدكتور اللي اتفضل يا دكتور ايوه لو في اي حد عنده سؤال بالعربي او بالانجليزي انا يعني مستعد احاول اجاوب عليه الدكتور سعيد سفيان اتفضل او سا... او سعد سفيان سفياني اتفضل عندك سؤال Yeah. Assalamu alaikum.
عليك السلام شكرا دكتورة على البرزنتيشن I would like to ask about real earning management what is the best techniques used by manager to manipulate earning management Okay, for, uh, under real manipulation, uh, the uh, most important paper, I would say, is the Roy Chowdhury 2006, which looked at three different techniques for real manipulation. The first one of them is sales manipulation. It is companies that come to the end of their financial period. Uh, if they find that their profits are uh, below what they should be, uh, what they do is they try to sell a lot more things quickly at a discount. So this uh, increases their sales revenue, but it uh, inevitably will, will uh, lead to a reduction in sales in the future period. And they may have to sell at lower prices and therefore their cash flow uh, during the current year might be re reduced for the level of sales. Operating cash flow. Sorry, Malik? Operating cash flow. Operating cash flow. Oh. Yes. Uh, deep to be investigated through the abnormal operating cash flows. Uh, another technique is through uh, increasing production. Uh, manufacturing. Uh, profits are going to be too low, they can increase production and therefore ill fixed overhead costs will be distributed over a larger number of products and this will lead to a reduction in the cost of goods sold. So they are abnormal um, cost of goods sold or abnormal production costs. Then the third technique is through reduction in discretionary expenses. So expenses uh, مش necessary is uh, uh, advertising, research and development. Yeah. Again, if a company is going to miss its profit target, then they can reduce these expenses. So those are the three typical real earning manipulation techniques. But, but it's uh, uh, industry matter in uh, earning management because uh, the major study in earning management focuses on uh, uh, on industry uh, sector. Oh, bizarre. Financial sector uh, also uh, uh, do uh, management. Mm. Yeah. Financial yeah. sector, but there's very little research about real manipulation in the financial Google. sector. Google meeting. Google, Google, uh, Google meeting, eh? And this actually might be a, a good way to uh, go forward. Uh, trying to look at the financial sector and what particular uh, expenses within this sector uh, can be used for real manipulation. Um, they don't have obviously production, so, so you cannot investigate their production. They don't have sales, but you can investigate something like their interest revenues uh, if they try to push uh, higher loans at uh, higher interest rates, let's say, and make higher revenues abnormally. But uh, all the theory, uh, uh, empirical model of Johnson, Johnson modified, Kothari, they show all focused on uh, industry, not uh, on financial. Exact. Uh, Hatta accrual manipulation. The models of accrual manipulation are all targeted towards non-financial companies. There is very little uh, uh, literature in the banking sector other than for specific accounts like the security securitization, mortgage resecuritization, uh, just very specific accounts. But there's nothing, uh, I mean, their accruals is different from non-financial companies. So there's not a lot of research in, in banks and other financial companies. And again, that might be a way to, Thank you so much. to go forward. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, I just want to ask you. Uh, are, are you with me? I cannot hear you. El sot malish mushwada. My so my question is, um, uh, I I I have the topic that I am currently working on. Uh, the topic is, uh. Uh, the uh, 
the mediating effect of firm characteristics on the relationship between uh, corporate tax planning, uh, audit quality, earnings management, and financial reporting fraud. So, uh, under earnings management, I I measure earnings management using accrual earnings uh, management mm -hmm. using performance match model, and yes. then under the um, uh, audit quality, I uh, I took the three measurement of audit quality, which are um, uh, audit fee, audit independence, and then uh, I took um, the, uh, the other measurement of uh, audit size, which is big four and non big four. So, mm -hmm. and for the corporate tax planning, I took a measurement of. Uh, 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 determinants of uh, corporate tax planning. So, um, and then for for the DV, I try to look at uh, financial reporting fraud, which is another aspect of finance management. So, what do you see in this topic? Uh, can you give me any uh, advice uh, regarding this topic? Uh, I'm not sure what ad advice you're seeking. I mean, uh, on the face of it, it looks good. Uh, I would say that probably there's been a lot of research that has investigated uh, how audit quality is related to earnings management. Um, I don't know how you're going to differentiate uh, between fraud and the management. If you're going to investigate separately, companies that have high earnings manipulation that eventually lead to fraud, or not. Um, so it, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe if you'd like to email me separately and, and ask me a specific question, I'd be happy to help. But overall, the idea looks good. Uh, but I would say you have to try to push a little bit further to make a, a contribution to the literature because there's been a lot of uh, prior research which has investigated similar things. Okay. Okay, but uh, based on my uh, based on my topic, I try to combine three items for my IV, and then using it against uh, financial reporting fraud as my DV, and then the measurement of financial reporting fraud, I try to use corporate litigation. That is a dummy variable. That is one if the if that. Uh, company is sanctioned, and then zero if the company is not sanctioned. Mm -hmm. What so, sample do you have? Which country? Of what data do you have? From which country? Yeah, yeah. I'm um, uh, I'm I'm measuring um, uh, African countries, mm -hmm. West African countries. Okay, uh, so you're looking, you're investigating companies that have litigation against them. And you want yeah. to see if they have engaged in fraud or not. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, uh, it may be interesting to actually start this off as a uh, qualitative paper with some kind of survey. And you go and, and talk to some people that have, so com some companies that have failed and ask them what they were, what they did and why they in were inclined to uh do some fraudulent activities, see if they talk to you, and maybe we'll give you a better idea of, of how to go forward with this. Okay. Thank you, Prof, for the insightful advice. Thank you You're very welcome. much. You're welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Problem, sir. Alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum. Can I have a chance, please? Fadal. Thank you very much, Dr. Ibrahim, Dr. Salma Ibrahim, I'm Dr. Saleh from Sudan. I'm Dr. Saleh. Hello, Dr. Saleh. I'm Dr. Saleh. I'm a part of the presentation, but I would like to thank you for the valuable information that you provide. I'm just asking about two issues. First, about the regulatory, the regulatory aspect of mm -hmm. uh, smoothing uh, the airing uh, beer share for any company. Is there any regulation uh, side? Uh, this first. Uh, second, you mentioned uh, the securitization. What is the link between 
uh, let's do top edge case. Okay. So first question you're asking about if there's any regulation against income smoothing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, uh, the regulation is uh, is the same as the accounting regulation. I mean, companies uh, within the UK, let's say, have to follow international financial reporting standards, and this requires them to show a true and fair view of. Uh, the financial statements. Therefore, any deviation from the true and fair view, whether through income smoothing or uh, pushing profits upwards, downwards, is considered against the regulation. Uh, the level or the magnitude of how much you differ from the true and fair view is obviously uh, uh, the question or the issue, and um, and and whether you have in in. In, in whether you have committed any fraud, not just the deviation by using your judgment. I mean, the, a, a lot of the accrual manipulating literature could be through using judgment, through creating reserves uh, that may not be fraudulent behavior. But if you have gone towards fraudulent behavior and you have kind of some companies uh, write sales revenues that don't exist or they put customers' accounts that don't exist. This is fraud and that is illegal. So it depends really if it's just the judgment uh, or the fraud that has been committed. So the regulation comes through the accounting standards and through the true and fair view. Um, and, and this will be uh, looked at the, the level of fraud or, or not for judgment that is being provided. In terms of your second question, the securitization. So securitization within banks is a form of uh, strategy where uh, the banks can uh, sell off some of their loans and make profits. So it can potentially be used to manipulate their profits uh, in terms of the decision when to sell these securities and how much to sell them for. And there are just a limited research about this factor, and it has, I think, a couple of papers showed that uh, banks who are um, facing losses will use securitization uh, or some of the assumptions in the securitization, how much profit to or how much revenue to report uh, as a me method for earnings management. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you. Salam alaikum, Doctora. Alaikum salam. Thanks for your uh, for uh, when we talk about the cosmetics accounting or creative accounting or uh, sometimes earning management. Uh, from your uh, point of view, uh, can be considered opportunistic behavior of management, or it is contributing to improving the image of uh, company. Thanks. Uh, that's a difficult question to answer. In general, I believe that most companies that engage in uh, creative accounting are doing it for an opportunistic reason, because that's those are the cases that we hear of. Tesco, Enron, Patisserie Valerie, uh, they all engaged in earnings management or what we can call creative accounting in order to hide poor performance. Uh, but there could be examples. Uh, in practice of companies that may be just trying to present their numbers in somewhat a slightly better way uh, in order to attract more customers or attract more shareholders. So it may not be opportunistic. Um, and there is evidence in the literature about the signaling view, but it's much less. So both exist and it really it's which type of company engages in it. But I think that most companies that in creative accounting or doing it for an opportunistic reason. Hope that helps. Thanks. Can I ask a question, please? Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Thank you very much, Victor, for, uh, for the excellent lecture. I have uh, a question. Is there relationship between company governance and profit uh, management. Thank you. My name is Walid Mehsin from Iraq. Thank you. So you have a question about the relationship between corporate governance and earnings management? Yes. Okay. So uh, 
again, there's been a lot of literature that has investigated this. So corporate governance, things like uh, the independence of the board, uh, the size of the board, and especially focusing on the audit committee and the compensation committee. Because remember, the incentives for manipulation are usually coming from personal CEO incentives, which are going to be linked to compensation. So the compensation committee is going to be important here. Um, and then also the monitoring effect will come through the auditing and the board independence. So anything that in the board, within the governance structure, that links to either compensation or monitoring will be important to investigate. Uh, so the higher the monitoring, the less the earnings management, or the higher the compensation provided linked to profit, the higher the earnings management. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor. Okay, hello. Can I ask a question, please? Hello. Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is Nisreen Melih from Egypt. I want to ask you, I, I want to first thank you so much for your presentation. It was very great. Thank you very uh, much. Secondly, I want to ask you a question about a suggested research area that you presented at the end of your presentation, which is the association between the COVID-19 and the earnings management. Mm-hmm. Uh, it encouraged me really to, to investigate this research area, but I want to ask you, uh, do I have to wait until 2020 is over and the financial statements of 2020 are declared so that I can um, uh, investigate this relation or is there a solution to do it right now? Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, I think it would be hard to investigate this right now, but you can start if you're looking purely at, uh, let's say, the Egyptian setting, you would have to wait for the financial statements to come out. If you are going to be investigating uh, a capital market like the US, the UK, uh, then you can look at some of the quart quarterly announcements that they make uh, or the quarterly financial statements, and therefore you can start looking uh, soon. But probably the best case would be to wait for the end of the 2020 financial uh, period uh, and then start investigating the differences between the full year 2020 and 2019. And my expectation is that companies that have not failed, I mean, a lot of companies are going to fail and go out of business, but those that do not fail are going to use the opportunity of 2020 to push down all of their profits to do a big bath and report as many reserves as possible so that they can save profits for the future because nobody expects companies to make profits now. And in addition to that, uh, different countries are providing uh, tax breaks and help to companies, and therefore they need, the companies will be incentivized to show that they are not doing well and they are making losses so that they can get those tax breaks and, and collect money from the government. Okay, thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. <laughs> uh, so, sorry, I'm here again. I, during the course of your your discussion, uh, yes. you did mention of um, earnings management uh, is something that uh, the managers benefited from it. Yeah. It's something that the managers benefited from it. Yeah. Uh, so my question ah. is. Uh, Anis management, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Okay, well, that again, that goes back to the question of uh, whether it's for an opportunistic view or, or an informational perspective. So there are two yeah. different views. Uh, but if you're focusing on the private gain by managers, then it is a bad thing. Because what will happen is that managers will get their bonus, they will get their option pay, their compensation, and any money that they get extra that they don't deserve is coming out from either future research and development or uh, uh, dividend payments to their shareholders. So this will not benefit other stakeholders other than the managers themselves. So I think that that is a bad thing. If it's opportunistic for private gains, then it is a bad thing for everybody involved other than the managers. Thank you very much, bro. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Mahmoud. Mohammed Al Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you very much, Prof, for the informative presentation. Uh, Thank you.
Okay, uh, I'm focusing on uh, the CEO characteristic and uh, real earning management. Mm -hmm. my area nowadays. So, uh, some researchers or previous studies, uh, uh, like they, they expect or they they uh, used to to uh, uh, consider earning management as a positive, and some others are a negative to the firms. So, how can we differentiate? which is negative or positive to the firm. Thank mm -hmm. you. I, I think one way to differentiate is try to uh, investigate the future from the future. So for example, a lot of the things signaling the future. For the, for living, well, it's, uh, looks at earnings management as a positive thing. So that earnings management in year, let's say, uh, the voice is not clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, back again. To show the positive impact of earnings management, you need to show that in the year where earnings management has been done, if I have used real manipulation in 2020, then this will lead to higher profits in year 2021 or 2022 and so forth. So you can try to find the link in association between earnings management, discretion accruals this year, or the real manipulation this year, and future profitability or future performance. Uh, that's one way. Another way is to try to link it to the share price, um, where uh, you're looking more at the perception of investors. If investors in the stock market believe that this earnings management is a positive thing, then they will push the share price upward. So it has to be a link with some kind of future view of either profitability or performance. And maybe you can try to break it down into a portion that is linked to future positive performance and another portion that is linked to negative aspects of performance. Uh, and it could be possible that earnings management will have both the positive and the negative view. Uh, although, yeah, yeah, that hasn't been investigated before. Thank you very much, Paul. And I, I think probably if you're looking at real manipulation specifically, um, just from how it's uh, how it's measured, this most likely will have a future negative impact. If you're going to be dropping your advertising and research and development expenditures, then this is not going to help you in the future. If you're going to be increasing production without selling, it's not going to help you in the future. So I think it's going to be harder for you to uh, to argue that real manipulation will is a, is a good thing that will benefit the future. But if you can find a, a link with the future profitability then, that might be an indicator. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Dr. Ali, Dr. Ali, Tfadal. Dr. Ali, you have a question? Dr. Ahmed? Allah. السلام عليكم أنا دكتورة مبارك الله فيك أنا حاليا أقوم بالدراسة على forward looking information disclosure and its relation with the earning management you know that the conflicting results in the previous studies that some studies say that there is a positive relation and others say that a negative what do you think is the the reason for this uh, conflicting and what's uh, variable uh, should you you, sh you advise to to study uh, to uh, as a moderating variable for this uh, uh, relation mm. and uh, what's the best techniques uh, to start to investigate uh, for real uh, earning management for this uh, relation okay okay thank you for the question i i assume forward uh, disclosures forward related disclosures would would be captured through uh, content analysis and uh, a lot of the mixed results may be due to the measure itself how this is captured um, what kind of forward related statements are uh, counted in the measure of uh, disclosure so this is very much related to the paper that I just showed about risk, the relationship between risk disclosures and uh, income smoothing. 
Uh, and I think what you have to focus here is on uh, the issue whether you believe these are substituted, whether whether presenting more forward looking disclosures is a substitution or uh, a complementary disclosure along with earnings management. So if it is maybe opportunistic, an opportunistic manager might try to hide forward-looking statements and in addition to that manipulate profit upwards, whereas under signaling they might be providing more forward-looking disclosures and more uh, and, and less earnings management. So I think the, the results in the literature could be mixed because of first how things are being measured, how the forward related statements are being measured, and also the characteristics of firms. It may be that some firms that are opportunistic will have a positive link between both of those things and firms that are uh, doing it for a signaling purposes will will have another relationship. So, so I think just mixing all companies together in one group may not be uh, the best and you might have to investigate specific companies that you believe have opportunistic incentives versus signal incentives by looking at some other characteristic like CEO pay or something like that. Uh, 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 last question, please. I'm thinking about uh, uh, studying moderating the uh, role for uh, IFRS and uh, governance for this relationship and uh, for uh, uh, listed uh, uh, companies in uh, Malaysia and uh, uh, stock market. Okay, so you're trying to look at the moderating loan of, of uh, the regulation. So if yeah. a company is uh, following IFRS, they will have more restrictions than if they're not? Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah, well, I think then you're investigating a lot of different things. I, I see focus on one of the issues um, and rather than trying to to focus on too many factors here like looking at companies that are are uh, following IFRS standards versus not in addition to those that are opportunistic versus not is just lots of different variables there um, so I think either stick with a full sample and 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 investigate the moderating effect of the, of the standards or try to differentiate opportunistic and signaling firms into different groups Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, bro, for your advice. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Blen. Dr. Blen, Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Uh, thank you so much, Doctor, for this informative uh, presentation. Really, we learn a lot in earning management. Thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, my question is that uh, I just want to ask about the validity of uh, earning management measurement because you know when we implement this measurement in any sample it gives uh, it, it just gives us the residual mm -hmm. uh, we cannot exactly determine that this is this company's practice earning management or not mm -hmm. because uh, it, does, it doesn't make sense if we uh, use it in different sample all uh, result is safe so do you think that researcher now has to look for more robust measurement related to earning management. This mm -hmm. is my first question. My second question is, as you know, real earning management is uh, uh, under the uh, discretion of management. So how we are going to uh, reduce or mitigate real earning management? Because it is not against the rules. It is not also against the standards. This is my two questions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. In, in terms of your first question, I think it's very important that researchers try to uh, to improve on the m model for uh, detection of earnings management. And surprisingly, I mean, uh, all of the models now are still based on the Jones 1991 model. So, so we haven't made any improvements since then, where you have a regression and you take the residual as the level of abnormal or discretionary accruals. So if, uh, if one can find a better way to determine for a fact that manipulation has happened, I think this would be a, a huge contribution to the research. Although I would say that it's gonna be quite difficult because I'm sure that many researchers have attempted, uh, and that was my whole PhD where I was trying to improve 
the modified Jones model, and uh, I was able to show a slight improvement, but but again. Uh, not something huge that will I impact the whole literature. So I, I would say it is very important, but it is going to be quite hard to, to make any improvements to this modeling technique. In terms of your second question, uh, I think your question is that r real earnings management techniques can happen and they are not necessarily illegal. Uh, how can companies mitigate uh, or, or reduce the prevalence of this from occurring? Uh, well, it really depends if they want to uh, reduce it, uh, if it actually has a negative impact on, on their future. So uh, if real earnings management is seen in particular companies to impact negatively on their future performance, on their future sales, uh, then those types of companies will be in need of mitigating uh, the occurrence of this real manipulation. And the only way it can be done is through uh, the governance. So through things like the independence of the board, the audit committee, uh, the monitoring or the incentive impact on the board. Those are the only two factors other than regulation. Uh, regulation probably is not gonna have too much to say in here. So I think it's really the governance within the company, the board effect that needs to mitigate the occurrence of real manipulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Buchero or uh, Bucharo. Bucharo, uh, any question? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor, for the quality of your presentation. Thank you so much for sharing with us your thoughts and knowledge. Uh, I have, like, if you don't mind, one question uh, related to earnings management models. Mm -hmm. you know, like you know, there are numerous earnings management models. Uh, I would like to, to know how can we know which model is the best one, uh, like according to which criteria can we choose our model? Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Thank you. OK, so because there are lots of models out there, I think the best way to go forward is to use the one that is, is uh, most popular. If your particular research is not about improving the models of earnings management, then my suggestion is to, to look at the, the Chawital 2010 paper, which was about earnings quality, and they have provided in there a nice table that compares uh, or, or presents the different models of, of uh, discretionary pool manipulation um, and, and use one of those. I mean, the one that I like to use is the modified uh, Jones with the Kothari modification performance matched model, uh, which I think between that one and uh, the De Chao, uh, I think 2002 one, which includes the uh, future and, and previous year's cash flow, those are probably the most, the two most popular models that are in use currently. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mustafa Mohammed. Shukran, uh, Fandim. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Salma. Alaikum, Salam. Very much thanks for your very well crafted presentation and the insights that we received today. Uh, in fact, I'm seeking your perspective about uh, some issue in earning management, which uh, basically represents your underlying argument that managers will be rationally, uh, intentionally motivated to manage earnings. Mm -hmm. uh, what would be your perspective if we talk about irrationality of management when management actually have kind of uh, unintentional perspective in terms of their intent tendency for being optimistic, uh, narcissistic, narcissistic, you know, kind of, uh, and how that can be affecting the earning management itself. Uh, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is a very good perspective, and there's not a lot of research uh, about that, although there is a, uh, some research about the risk-taking behavior of managers, especially narcissistic type of managers who engage in uh, uh, buying and acquiring other companies just because they think they're great. Uh, and this could come into play in, in, in earnings management behavior uh, where they think that their level of profit should be at a certain amount. And if they don't see it, uh, they increase profit towards that amount. So 
potentially it could be leading them to choose a particular benchmark instead of the normal benchmarks that are studied, which are previous year's earnings or earnings equal to zero or the analysts' uh, uh, forecast, they may have their own benchmark with what they believe they should be achieving based on their uh, personal uh, irrational behavior. So it could actually be interesting if you try to mix that with the literature that talks about the benchmark beating, uh, looking at uh, the normal distribution of firms around certain benchmarks. If you can try to investigate what benchmarks managers, narcissistic managers, will uh, have as their reference point, that, then that actually could be quite interesting. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any other questions? Hello. Hello. Uh, I have a question about, uh, I have a study uh, about uh, the impact of office on earning uh, management. Mm -hmm. My question, uh, how can I choose uh, the model uh, for my number? Uh, so you're talking about the earnings management model? Yeah. OK, um, similar to the question that was asked before, I think uh, you need to look at read a lot of literature and, and find what is most commonly used. And in the accrual manipulation literature, probably the one that is used the most is the modified Jones, which is modified by uh, the Chow et al. 1995, with the performance matched uh, methodology, which is the Kothari et al. 2005. So I think that would be your best bet uh, that will alleviate concerns about misspecification of the model. So it's the modified Jones with the Kothari et al. 2005 performance matched modification. Uh, the model of uh, Jones uh, and Kothari? Yes, yes. If you read the Kothari et al. paper in 2005, they use the modified Jones, but they also uh, did a performance matching. So matching each company to a company with similar performance. I think yeah. that, that is the best model to use. Thank you. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, alaikum salam. Okay, sir. Tawadda. Shukran. شكرا جزيلا لحضرتك يا دكتوره على العرض الممتاز ده انا سريعا كده انا عندي ثلاث اسئله تكنيكال شويه في في التشغيل بتاع الموديل آه السؤال الاول آه لما بقرا في البيبرز اللي استخدمت جونز موديل او اي موديل استيميتر ريزيدوالز بيستخدموا طبعا التكنيك بتاع اندستري اير آه السؤال بقى في الـ في المينيم اوبزرفيشن اللي اللي هران عليه الموديل في كتير بيستخدم انا شفت ارقام كتير في كتير بيستخدم 30 اوبزرفيشن خصوصا الدراسات بتاعه اليو اس في بيستخدم 8 وفي بيستخدم 6 وشفت 10 فانا سؤالي الارقام دي تحديدا اتحددت بناء على ايه انا عارف طبعا كل ما العدد يزيد ده افضل عشان الاستيميشن يكون ادق للريزيدوالز فالارقام دي تحديدا اتحددت بناء على ايه والسؤال بقى الاهم لما اجي اعمل سبميت لبيبر بخبره حضرتك في النشر الدولي هل الاديتور او او الريفيور بيناقش الاوثر في العدد ده معنى خدت مثلا 8 اوبزرفيشن 10 اوبزرفيشن 30 اي وات ايفر ده السؤال الاولاني اكمل ولا ولا حضرتك سؤال بسؤال؟ لا لا اتفضل انا هكتب السؤال السؤال الثاني لما اقدر الريزيدوالز واحطها كديبندنت فيريبل في التست موديل بتاعي الفاست ماجورتي من البيبرز بيحط الابسولوت نمبر الريزيدوال قليل جدا اللي شفته خد الساين ده الساين ده اب نورمال اكريولز وحطها في الموديل كديبندنت انا سؤال ليه معظم البيبرز بتحط الابسولوت نمبر خلي بقى حضرتك ممكن النتيجه تختلف دراماتيكلي لو خدت الساين ده او خدت الابسولوت ليه الساين الساين ده مش بي يعني مش مش شائع قوي مش كومن في, في البيبرز ده السؤال الثاني وبرده نفس السؤال لما اجي اعمل سبميت وانا خدت الساين ده مثلا هل ريفيور يقول لي ليه ما خدش الابسولوت زي معظم او زي الكومون يعني؟ السؤال الاخير هو خاص بالكلاسيفيكيشن شيفتنج 
الميثودولوجي بتاعت الكلاسيفيكيشن شيفتنج انا بعمل ريجريست للابنورمال كول ايرنينجز على السبيشال ايتمز السبيشال سبيشال ايتمز الدراسات اللي استخدمتها جابتها يا اما من كومبيوستات في امريكا او من داتا ستريم في اليو كي السؤالي لو انا حبيت اطبق الموديل ده على مصر كلاسيفيكيشن شيفتنج مصر ما فيش فيها داتا بيز بتفصح عن سبيشال ايتمز ولكن انا ستيل اقدر احسبها بمسدريكت ب معادلة حسابية. هل منطقي إن أنا أحسب السبيشال أيتمز وأطبق الموديل ده على مصر ومفيش أصلاً في القايمة عندنا باند اسمه سبيشال أيتمز بيعرض؟ ده السؤال الأخير. شكراً لحضرتك. طيب ميرسي جدا. أوكي أول سؤال اللي هي number of observations in the industry year model. Okay, so this uh, question relates to the statistics. Yani under statistics, with different statistical books, will tell you what is the minimum number of observations that you should have to run a regression to give you an unbiased coefficient. Uh, the, in general, it, it, it is seen as 30. But 30, طبعا, is, is a very big number, the small samples. And I'm going to 6 or 8. But in general, in my papers, I'm going to 10 as a number, a minimum number of observations. And I think 10 is a good enough number. Uh, I've never been questioned when I submitted papers. I, I was never questioned uh, on my use of 10. I think possibly if you use abnormal numbers, Haggad, that is not like a, a multiple of 10, you may be questioned. And it starts looking like you or manipulating the numbers that you're including in there. So I suggest you use a multiple of 10, and my preference would be, or as a minimum, minimum, uh, would be 10. Okay, so that's your first question. Uh, second question relates to using the absolute value of residuals as your dependent variable in the step two, after you have measured uh, discretionary calls. And uh, actually, it is not very common to use absolute uh, values. It is usually the signed uh, discretionary cool that is used. In all of my papers, I have always used the signed number, either positive or negative. The absolute value is used in certain instances where you don't care about the direction of the manipulation, but you care about the magnitude. It's not important if you manipulated upwards or downwards, but so you want to see how far away from zero or whatever benchmark, uh, that's what's important for you. So they are used in different instances. If you're just trying to see whether manipulation is happening, you should be using the signed one. But if you're trying to show the magnitude of it happening, then you should be using the absolute value. And again, uh, reviewers will question you on this and editors will question you if you have used a measure that is not linked to your particular question that you're asking. So if it's the magnitude, use the absolute value. And the final question about the special items in classification shifting. If in Egypt, there is no special item that is presented to the shareholders uh, on the form of the income statement, that it would be very hard for you to argue that managers are actually classif classifying things into that group. So the argument of classification shifting is that uh, investors look at the face of the income statement and they focus on the item that they believe is recurring. But if they're going to have to calculate what the recurring items are, they, then they're not going to bother. So I think it's not worthwhile to in investigate something that is not actually presented on the face of the income statement. Okay, I hope that answers your questions. السؤال الأخير يا دكتورة بخصوص الـ special items هي هو مش نص صريح في في الـ في الـ في الـ statement إن ده special items ولكن بيستخدم ألفاظ زي other in other expense other revenue لو ده موجود something like that statement يبقى آه it's worthwhile investigating بس لو ده مش تفصيلها تفصيلها بيبقى في النوتس مش في صلب القايمة النوتس للاسف يعني ان جنرال معظم الانفسترز مش هيقروا النوتس فلو حاجه مكتوبه في النوتس uh, انت ممكن ت انفستيجيت سمثينج ديفرنت بس مش كلاسيفيكيشن شيفت ميبي ممكن ت انفستيجيت uh, ان هم بيحاولوا يخبوا حاجات اند ريبورت ات اونلي ان ذا فوت نوتس بس مش شيفتنج بير سي بس اتس وات ار ذي سين ان ذا نوتس ذات از وورث وايل انفستيجيتنج 
Okay, but the Ra'i, you may find it differently. But for Ra'i, Anna, if it's not on the face of the financial statement, then uh, classification shift in itself is not uh, what you want to be investigating. Shukran, Gizina, Dr. Shukran. Uh, I think uh, I think that uh, you have uh, done very well with answering a lot of questions uh, there, uh, dear Prof uh, Salma. So thank you very much. Uh, ended uh, so all that remains for me to say is uh, thank you very everyone uh, that uh, joined us, and I thank you very much for uh, taking the time out uh, to present to us today, uh, dear Prof uh, Salma. It's be really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shukran, Muhammad. Thank you very much for everybody there. Shukran, al hadirin Wa atmanna in najah liku daim, inshallah. Shukran. Shukran, Gazian. Okay, we'll see again. Bye. 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 B